So welcome everyone to Create and Remote Career Paths. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, what we're going to go over is a few introductions and ground rules. Please continue to introduce yourselves in the chat. I love to hear where you're from, what career you're currently working in, and ideally where you would like to transition. If you don't know where, what creative career path you'd like to transition into, that's totally okay. We're going to explore a lot of them. Um, and what you're going to hear today is a lot about design thinking and the creative process, as well as how it applies to all sorts of different career paths. Hats, including ones that you might already be in, uh, especially, you know, film and, and um, you know, film development and creation or creative writing or even cooking. Um, and what we're then going to move into is laws of UX or digital design and kind of how design thinking bleeds into I, uh, career paths that have a little bit more financial stability and how to still, you know, be creative in your everyday life while having a career that provides financial stability. And we're going to talk a lot about business viability. This is the part that's missing from a lot of UX courses or UX programs out there is about connecting UX and digital design um, with the business viability component, with understanding what makes a business viable and how to grow and scale a business. And that's the secret sauce that will help you get a financially stable career uh, in UX design. Because even in pockets of UX design, there are career paths that are not as financially stable. And so it's about finding that balance between the creative and then work-life balance and, of course, financial stability. And then finally, we'll actually go into what those creative career paths are and actually name them. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Samaya and I'm going to be your workshop facilitator for today. And I actually come from a pretty diverse background. I started by studying mechanical engineering at Carnegie Mellon before pivoting into UX design. So my first job out of college was in customer service and for a small education technology startup. And so I had the chance to speak to a lot of professors and students and uh, you know, help them with their courses. And then I also did sales demos for the deans and the administrators of these different universities. And that's when I really started to develop my love for design and UX. And so I have about um, not five years, but actually seven years of experience working in UX design across agencies, corporations, in the field. And I'm also the co-founder of Ideate Labs, which provides UX courses for women, people of color, and immigrants. And I also mentor students at Wharton's Venture Labs. And I'm currently a UX researcher at Disney Streaming and Hulu as well. So one of just my ground rules is just to be kind and always build on everybody's ideas here. What we're trying to do is create a psychologically safe environment where both good and bad ideas can be shared openly and freely. Remember, this is a no judgment zone and it's also a very low key environment. You'll see my cat here <laughs> interrupt the Zoom calls all the time. Every time I get on Zoom is the time she decides she wants to be with me. Um, so yes, a very, you know, calm, safe environment is what we're striving for. And it's also a, a nerd zone. So I'm a big nerd. I nerd out on all things design and creative. So if you ever have any questions on design, creative career paths, I'm, I'm always excited to hear about those questions. And you can ask me really any question. And so with that, uh, I'll just tell you a little bit of, about ID8 Labs before I dive right in. We provide a four-month design MBA to women, minorities, and people of color who are looking to break into a creative career path that's also financially stable. And a lot of our graduates end up making six figures after they graduate, and our whole goal is to make design accessible. So with that, I'm going to get into what is design thinking exactly and why should we care about it. Um, from the Interaction Design Foundation, there's a long, boring definition on what it is. Design thinking is a nonlinear, iterative process that teams use to understand users, challenge assumptions, redefine problems, and create innovative solutions to prototype and test. So that's quite a mouthful. 
really all that it is, is it's the process of collaborating with multiple groups to define problems and then find innovative solutions. And chances are that regardless of what job you're doing right now, you've probably applied some form of design thinking to your roles. Whether you are an administrator working on solving an HR process and optimizing an HR process, whether you're trying to simplify an operations process for a manufacturing company, whether you are working as a server in a restaurant and trying to optimize the rush hour and the lunch rush or dinner rush. Those are all problem solving skills uh, that lead to more streamlined solutions and also collaborating with different team members and managers. So we all apply design thinking to some extent in our everyday lives. And it's just a matter of figuring out when are those moments that you're really using design thinking, even if you're not in a creative job, and then rebranding it so that you can apply to more creative career paths. So with that, there are some roles that people mentioned already that actually already apply design thinking. And design thinking is so nebulous, it can be really applied anywhere. So in the film industry, you might apply design thinking to iterate on films, iterate on a script, and keep tweaking it and making it better until it suits all the different stakeholders and actors um, and, and folks who are working in production. And then everyone is kind of in agreement that this is the movie or series that we want to make. Uh, so that's the design process. It can be applied to furniture design and really iterating on different you know, forms so that, that suit a certain audience or community that, where that furniture is going to be sold or placed. It could apply to tattoo artists building a business. We actually had a tattoo artist who, go, who went through our four-month MBA and actually within four months, she was able to land her first UX job and actually lead UX initiatives at the startup that she was working for. And that creativity she used every day as a tattoo artist running her own business really transferred into skills uh, in her first UX job. Design thinking and the design process can also be applied to architecture. It can be applied to product design and designing different forms. It can be applied to graphic design and print design, uh, as well as cooking and even interior design. So you will see design thinking and the design thinking process in almost everything. So let's dive into a little bit more about what it is. Design thinking applies to all forms of creative thought, but it takes it one step further to be able to monetize the creative outputs and transform them into viable business solutions. So that's the part a lot of UX programs and creative programs and career programs don't really address. They talk about creativity, they talk about working in Figma, but they don't really address how does a certain design or product or piece of furniture or restaurant make money? And why is that restaurant or creative output making money? Why is that a viable business solution? So there's actually a lot of research and strategy that goes into building viable creative solutions uh, so that you can transfer them into viable business solutions. And that's the secret sauce, which will let you, you know, transition into more of a senior position or a more refined position within the creative world. And so that's something to really think about. And we'll explore that more in our 10 minute MBA at the end. So this talk does not also advocate for being a starving artist or creative. The reason we, we wanted to put this talk together is because it's not about, you know, only following your passion and kind of having to give up a lot along the way to follow your passion. Almost any creative career, if done well, and if thought through from the lens of design thinking, can be really successful and can provide that creative with work-life balance and stability. So an example is one of my friends, she is an opera singer and she is super practical about how she goes about her career. She understands that because in the world of opera, uh, it's very competitive, uh, even though she's a soprano, she has a lot to compete with. She has to understand how to network and she really thinks about her opera career like she's running a business, which is what has led her to be a really successful opera art, you know, singer. She's sung at places like the Met and she's held really, you know, good, great positions in different operas. I'm not the best opera person. I don't know all the names, uh, but, you know, she'll tell you that. And I think what 
sets her apart from other opera singers is she doesn't think like an artist. She thinks half like a business owner and half like an artist. So she actually spends half her time on the sales, marketing, networking initiatives that it takes to become a successful artist. She has a TikTok following of 20,000 folks who really like to hear what it's like to be in the opera world. And she's really thought through the strategy of selling her services and her skills. And that's what sets her apart from other artists who might be the starving artist stereotype. And so what design thinking helps you do is really think about be becoming a viable business or a viable freelancer. And at a personal level, it's just all about finding balance. So, you know, creativity is great, but we cannot only follow our passion and only, you know, live 24 seven, living, breathing, working, creative, right? We have to figure out some sort of work-life balance so that our whole lives are balanced so that we have the rest and time that we need to take a rest, to go out for a walk, to exercise, to spend time with our friends and family and our kids, and also have a certain amount of financial security where we're not always thinking about where the next paycheck is coming from. Uh, and that is kind of the ideal we would like everyone to be in. Um, and we've helped lots of women transition into really stable, creative and remote careers where they are able to achieve this. So with that, I'm going to give you the 101 on design thinking. What exactly is the design thinking process? Uh, according to Nielsen Norman Group, which is a great um, resource, the design thinking process can be visualized as a circle. And the circle has six different steps. And these six different steps can be applied within a two week time frame or a two week sprint, a two month long project, or maybe even a two year long project project. And it starts with empathizing with certain users and stakeholders who might use that product or creative output, and really talking to different groups to understand what they want, what their needs are, and then trying to prioritize and balance different needs. And as you're starting to prioritize and balance different needs, you're starting to define the scope of work, the scope of creative work. What's the biggest problem that you're trying to solve? What are the priorities? And also, what are the things that you have to deprioritize? Because you cannot solve everybody's problem, but you need to solve the most pressing problem, the problem that is most likely to become a viable business solution, the problem that is most likely to be sold in the market where people are actually willing to put down money for the solution to the problem. And they're not just, you know, it's not a lukewarm problem where they're okay to suffer a little bit. It's a really urgent problem that they're willing to spend money, time and effort on. And then as you're starting to, you know, scope that out, you start to ideate and you come up with a broad range of ideas or solutions that could solve that one urgent problem. And you do blue sky ideation, you get really creative, but then you have to start to go back down to bare bones and you have to start to think, okay, from the technical and operations constraints, can I build this in two to three months? Because if I take two years to build this, user behaviors might change. Think of the pandemic, right? People's behaviors changed in four months and a lot of restaurants went out of business because they weren't able to pivot fast enough or react to changing needs from their customers. So can you build this in a short amount of time? It's what we called the MVP or minimum viable product in the startup world. And then from a business perspective, if you put you know, a price tag on it, would people actually be willing to buy it? So that's where we get into prototyping. We in IE8 Labs also talk about prototyping. So before you even go out and spend time, money and effort on building a potential solution, we want to validate that people want to buy your solution in the first place. So remember that you know, out of all these startup products that launch, 90% of startups fail, and that's because they haven't gone through the design process in with a lot of rigor, and it usually is driven by founders' egos, and they've not really validated their product or even solved a real problem for users. So we really want to make sure that as we prototype, we're testing, are people willing to buy this? And can we be at least 60 to 70% confident with quantitative data that we gather from these thought experiments that yes, this idea is going to probably succeed in the market. We can never be 100% confident 
it is after all a creative process and it is a little bit subjective, but what we do do is balance qualitative and quantitative data within this process to make sure that when we pitch to business stakeholders, when we pitch to investors, when we pitch to corporate executives, that we have enough data to back up our ideas and we can prove to them with qualitative and quantitative data that yes, the solution is very likely to succeed in the market. Once we've sort of proved that to them, we can start to actually launch a beta test. So we can test our solutions with users. We can run a beta in the corporate world with a larger group of audience members or, or customers. And then if we notice that those tests are doing well and we're starting to prove even more with uh, more sophisticated tests that you know this is succeeding in the market, then yes, we can actually implement that idea, put it into effect. And we also have to be disciplined at this point. If we do prototype and test it and see data that shows that this, these ideas are failing, we have to give up on that idea and kill that idea. And we have to let our egos out of it, keep our egos out of it and be okay with completely scrapping that idea and going back to the chopping board, which is really hard to do sometimes. And we have to be a little bit detached from our creative work. And so there's multiple ways to visualize this. You can think of it as a double diamond, which is often how it's visualized. And in terms of our four month design MBA, we spend about seven weeks on trying to design the right thing. So in week one, most of our cohort members choose a project topic. They start to do a lot of research to understand what that market looks like. They also apply business thinking or blue ocean strategy. So how can they choose a market or community that's invisible or underserved by mainstream brands where there's little or no competition? rather than choosing a topic where it's a saturated market and there's already a lot of competition. So you can be really strategic about how you choose your project topic, how you position your product from day one so that you're more likely to succeed as a startup idea or company. They then research or interview eight to 16 uh, users or community members to really understand the problem space. And then they, by week three, they kind of narrow down on what's the most urgent problem they need to solve for that community based on the qualitative data. And then they start to synthesize all that data they're gather gathering from the community. So they come up with insights and themes. They diverge, come up with a whole bunch of solutions, and then narrow down those solutions based on operations constraints, financial constraints, and pretotyping. And they're also gathering some quantitative data. They wanted to validate which of their ideas are most likely to be bought in the market, and they're generating some quantitative data on that. And that's how they land at their one project pitch or product pitch at the midterms during week seven of the program. Once they have kind of honed what the product pitch is, then they go on and spend time designing things right. So they spend the next seven weeks coming up with different ways to visualize their solution and coming up with the information architecture of that solution and building a design system for that solution, as well as testing and iterating on it in multiple ways. So by the time they get to week 14, they have created uh, you know, a fully fledged digital product and they've gone through the end-to-end -end design process. And then they spent the last two weeks of the program uh, building a portfolio and resume so that they can start to apply for creative roles. Again, just a different way to visualize it. Um, this is my favorite way to visualize it. So really all the design thinking process is, is preloading it on the front end to gather as much qualitative and quantitative data as you can so that you're you know going through all this uncertainty but you're slowly starting to uh, categorize that uncertainty and you know put a method to the madness and organize all that chaos so that by the time you get to your midterms you will have a concept and you're pretty clear and focused on what your concept is and you're constantly gaining clarity and focus and around your concept and scoping it down to be more focused. So this is really what I think the design process really looks like. It's not very neat. It's actually super messy uh, and it's pretty chaotic and it doesn't look like these beautiful charts that you saw <laughs> before this one. It looks more like this. And so again, what we need to do with design thinking is reframe traditional perspectives as we move from problem to solution. 
And we really just need to find a way to communicate our insights in a way that reframes the problem and the solution. Um, so again, design thinking is not just about um, building an innovative solution. It's a lot of, about communication, communicating well with the community that you're trying to build for, almost co-creating with that community, and then talking to different stakeholders as well to gather context and potentially convince them to implement a solution. And again, it's always about finding new ways to look at the world and then talk about it. So storytelling is a major component of becoming a senior designer or creative. And again, it's very interdisciplinary. So as I mentioned, it touches on the creative, it touches on business, it touches on technical and operations constraints and feasibility as well. So another way to kind of describe design thinking is uh, you know, where it all intersects. The most valuable designs are found at the intersection of desirability, viability, and feasibility. And so when we're thinking about desirability, we're thinking about users. Does it fill a need? Does it fit into people's lives? Can we make them want it? When we think about viability, we're thinking about business goals. Does it align with the business goals? What's the return on investment? Can this be done within a budget? And then when we think of feasibility, we're thinking about technical and operations constraints. How long will it take to build this product or idea? So you might be wondering, why do we talk to users? What, you know, why, why is there all this, you know, qualitative and quantitative data that we're gathering from users in the first place? And this comes down to innovation. There's a lot of companies out there that don't do much research and just copycat other bigger companies. And guess what? They're never as innovative as the companies that actually do their own research. And the reason is when you take the time to talk to different users and really dig deep into what the problems they are thinking and feeling, and you get beyond the conscious level of problems. And what I mean by that is you're actually going out there and doing a one hour interview with each of these users and doing eight to 16 interviews to really understand the problem space, rather than just running a very superficial survey or focus group, you're going beyond the conscious right? If you're talking about a survey or a focus group or a Slack question that you put online in some forum, you're getting to people's conscious thinking. People know that they're being seen in a public space or setting, and they're going to present to you their rational thinking. But when we come down to interviews, what it really should start to feel like is a, a design therapy session where you're really acting like their dig digital therapist and you're getting that user or community member to open up about their emotions, their feelings, those subconscious attitudes and beliefs and instincts and values that they feel in their day-to-day -day life around the topic that you have chosen. And it's only when we get to that level of depth will we be really able to understand unique problems that that community is facing and then solve for those unique emotional problems. The most successful designs always hinge around an emotional problem. And so with that, we're also going to get into the laws of UX. So again, design thinking, as I had mentioned before, can be used across so many different um, disciplines and careers. Uh, but we're now we're going to kind of focus it down to the digital space, just because that's the space where I think it's most easy to pivot into and it offers the most amount of financial stability. Uh, so what I really advocate for, the reason I advocate for digital and UX design above all else is because it's a career path that's the easiest to pivot into and it offers that financial stability. When I say it's easiest to pivot into, it's much easier to pivot into UX design and research than it is to say coding, for example, that's really hard. Uh, it, it takes a lot more technical know-how and expertise. Same thing with marketing, you need to be able to understand how to use a lot of marketing tools and analytics tools. With design, it's more about creativity, the process, and also that business thinking. Uh, and it offers just as great a salary as say coding or marketing or any other creative career path. So that's why I'm focusing on UX 
more so than any anything else. And there another reason I'm focusing on UX is because there's so much demand for designers and researchers now. There's more and more apps that are being out there and built and developed, and we actually need more designers to join the workforce and fill those needs. Does anyone have any questions before I move, move on um, and go through um, more of this conversation? We're kind of at halftime right now. Any questions? All right, feel free to type a question into the chat um, as I go through things. Happy to answer them. So you might be wondering, okay, why is UX design the easiest to get into? Uh, one answer is Jacob's Law. So the thing is that users spend most of their time on websites and applications other than the one that you might be trying to design. And so their mental models are formulated around existing digital design patterns. So again, what we're trying to say is when you're building a new product, your product is competing with existing products and those mental models out there. A great example of this is Netflix, right? Netflix was one of the first to launch um, uh, a, a digital space where you could stream video and movies and films and series. And so what you'll notice is that a lot of the copycats and other streaming competitors and uh, even the TV sets like Roku copy Netflix's UI and style of doing things because Netflix was the first to do it. And that's the same um, across the board in design. You'll find that not many people, not many UX designers are creating completely new mental models of doing things, but they're really just copying uh, existing mental models. They might copy a playlist from Spotify or a way TikTok uses swipe or the way Tinder uses swipe. And they might, you know, hodgepodge together existing interaction patterns and existing ways of doing things uh, because users are already used to them. So there's no need to be super, super creative and think outside the box and come up with a whole new interaction pattern. But if you stick to the interaction patterns that users already know and understand, it's going to be a lot easier for them to adopt your product because they're already familiar with those interaction patterns, which is why you see a lot of similarities across different you know, types of platforms and apps. And to continue with Jacob's Law, new product development at established companies use, use Jacob's Law as well. So for example, Netflix, even though they're probably one of the biggest streamers, they were the first people to start streaming, they're still kind of indirectly competing with TikTok and Spotify, right? And so Netflix found that, you know, streaming platforms like TikTok actually took away time from folks watching Netflix because instead people were scrolling on TikTok and they were spending hours and hours during the pandemic looking at you know these user generated videos and so Netflix actually started to look at behavior patterns and interaction patterns used by their indirect competitors like Spotify and TikTok and they started to you know find that you know, the idea of scrolling through a playlist or clicking next on Spotify, as well as swiping up on TikTok, those were all patterns that they could potentially use. And they also started to, you know, study behaviors of channel surfing, right? There were a whole group of audience members who were still mostly focused on TV consumption and channel surfing and going through, you know, interfaces where they could channel surf. And so by 2021, Netflix came out with with a new feature called Play Something, which sort of worked like a TikTok feature where you could kind of channel surf. It also kind of worked like TV. So if you didn't know what to watch, you could just click Play Something and then you could like surf through a bunch of options that Netflix would recommend for you. So they started to play around with interaction patterns they were seeing elsewhere so that they could stay competitive and so that they could adhere to interaction patterns that their users were most familiar with. And so remember that we don't need to reinvent the wheel when we talk about UX design. Can your design be so good that it's almost invisible? And what I mean by that is when I click through Netflix, I don't have to think too hard. Everything is just happens to be where I find it. However, when I click into HBO, for example, or now I guess it's called Max, 
it's a little bit harder to use. And I have to think about where I need to go and what I need to do next. But with Netflix, I don't need to do that. Same thing with Spotify or TikTok. I just kind of am blindly consuming. And that's beautiful because now we're not even noticing all the interaction patterns and UI that it took to make such a seamless experience. So can we be so good that our designs are invisible? Another law to consider is Hicks law. So the time it takes to uh, to make a decision increases with the amount of complexity and the number of choices. Uh, again, uh, Netflix, maybe the reason they started to think about a play something feature is because as they grew as a business, there was so much content on their platform, right? And there were ways that they had cataloged all this content. They had come up with different categories and genres, and they have an algorithm that, you know, gives you a 98% recommendation, but still the more content they had, the more choice there was to users. And so it was harder for users to start to make decisions on their platform. And then here comes TikTok, which puts one piece of content in front of you, and then you don't have to make any decision. You're just blindly watching a piece of content at a time. So I think maybe Netflix also used Hicks Law to think about, okay, we have so much content, how do we really narrow it down and just put one piece of content at a time in front of users, kind of like Spotify, kind of like TikTok, so that we you know, take away barriers from having to spend all this time scrolling and finding content to watch. Another example of Hicks Law is Amazon. So Amazon actually has a one-click buy system, which I'm sure all of you have used, um, which makes it super easy to check out. And it's actually, a proprietary piece of technology that only Amazon has. So if anyone else uses a one-click buy, they actually have to license that one-click buy from Amazon. Another place you might have seen the one-click buy is the Apple Music Store where you click buy to buy a piece of music and Apple actually has to license that from Amazon because that's how proprietary the one click buy is. Um, so remember, time is money. And with Amazon kind of cutting all the steps in a checkout process out of the way with a one click buy, obviously, <laughs> they're making more money because of that. They're, they've completely streamlined the way it, you know, it takes to check out with something. And they reduce the decision making time, people can't linger and think, do I really need this thing? Or should I buy it later? No, nope. you just click buy and you've bought it. Um, and so again, that means revenue for Amazon. And so the time uh, to make a decision increases with the amount of complexity and the number of choices. If Amazon had a huge checkout process, chances are they wouldn't be making as much money. And so I hope that you know you're thinking through you know all these different interaction patterns and how these big giant companies like Netflix and Amazon operate. But then at the same time, we have to think from an ethical perspective. We are seeing titles like this come up as well. In Amazon, we trust, but why? So here we're starting to question, is it really good for Amazon to have the one-click buy or is it kind of detrimental to users? Or is there some amount of trust being taken away because of how Amazon operates? And we see more uh, titles like this every day. Don't trust Facebook, right? We, we want to go on Facebook to network with people that we know, but at the same time, we don't like what Netflix is doing to our data privacy and how they're kind of bombarding us with ads all the time. We get that Netflix, that you know Facebook has to make money, but it doesn't feel so good when it comes to the user experience. And so this is where we're kind of seeing that push and pull of what users actually want and need versus how is the company making money? And there's always gonna be that kind of push and pull. Um, and sometimes it, it goes in the favor of the company to the point where the user experience is really suffering, like we see with Facebook. I hate Meta, by the way. <laughs> I don't care if they hear this, um, but um, Instagram has become really, really hard to use where one in three posts is always an ad at this point. Um, and it's gotten to the point where I don't even know if I want to be on it anymore. Um, so how do you kind of balance the user experience with the business viability? Don't do it like meta <laughs> is all I have to say. So again, it all comes down to emotions and ethics, emotional design, as well as ethical design. So what is that give and take? What is that balance that we're trying to strike? And with that, I'm going to talk through our 10 minute MBA. Um, so you know, there is 
when we first start a company, and this is something you're going to notice if you join our four-month MBA program, we talk about problem solution fit, and we want to, you know, come up with a project topic where we're not in a very saturated market. Then by week seven, after, you know, gathering both qualitative and quantitative data, we actually have an MVP product that we can pitch and propose. Uh, and then as we, you know, start to build and design that product, we start to search for something called product market fit, where we're trying to see, okay, now that we've built this product, can we actually sell this product? Are we getting demand for this product? And if we are getting demand for this product, um, and if we've, you know, tweaked the product enough to, to the point where, you know, we're getting people to buy our product, slowly and slowly, we're spending more and more time with the selling aspects of the business rather than constantly tweaking the product or design. And we get when we get to that space, that's when we're at product market fit. And now we're really just focused on growing and scaling the business and really increasing sales and scaling to more users and reaching more audiences. And that's when we are at channel product fit. So you'll see startups go from MVP to starting to make money, which is product market fit, to then scaling to larger audiences or more mature audiences to the point where they get to maturity. Now they might be scaled globally. They might have become a global company um, and they're, they're very big. And it's really important to kind of understand these different growth cycles of a company because the creative work you do at these companies will vary depending on the size of the company. So doing creative work for a startup is going to look very different than doing creative work for a large corporation. And so what we're going to really focus on in our four month MBA is that beginning part. We're really focusing on launching an MVP or minimum viable product. And we're focusing on discovery interviews to really understand a certain com community or market space where we can create a product where there is little or no, no competition. And we do that with discovery interviews. So remember how I told you that uh, you know, the most innovative companies do their own research rather than copycatting other competitors in the market. We're really focusing on innovation. So we really have to put in the work to do those discovery inter interviews. And it's with that data that we gather that we can then come up with a solution. And ideally, our solution is so simple that we can build it in two to three months and we can monetize one feature so that we're getting paid from day one. One of the best examples I think of an MVP is Tinder. It's so easy, right? You look at pictures. It's nice and simple. You swipe right or you swipe left. If you like the person, you chat with them. If you swipe no, that's it. And you keep swiping and you keep playing the game. Um, that is a really great example of a very, very simple product where it's not, you know, like Meta, where you have all these thousands of tabs and thousands of features and it's super confusing to use. Simplicity, especially if you're a small business or startup, is often the best. And then as you start to, you know, get into product market fit, you're probably A-B testing. And you're probably testing different features or different ways of talking about your product and then trying to see, you know, what engages audiences the most. And then you start to define different audience segments or users. So, you know, you might start by selling to a small community or a group, but as you grow and scale, you're selling to more and more different types of audiences or segments. And so with that, that was kind of the 10 minute MBA on just understanding like the scale, how products scale as the company grows. That's going to be really important when understanding business viability of creative projects. We're no, now going to talk through the different terminologies for how design is practiced, as well as, you know, what are the similarities or commonalities across all these uh, different modes of design. So again, design thinking is the iterative process of reframing and re-understanding user problems at a deeper level. It's very interdisciplinary. Again, an example of design thinking at play is build, building innovative products that are a new take on how users should interact. A great example is Airbnb, the way they changed user behaviors and changed the you know, users going to hotels to users actually interacting with each other to find places to stay. 
Service design is the practice of improving an organization's internal practices and processes and the pooling of the company's resources to positively affect employees and indirectly the customers. So again, service design is a piece of design thinking, but you're really you know, going out there and, and working for these larger companies to improve internal processes. So for example, when I was a UX design consultant, I would work for large clients like Ford and Facebook. Facebook and uh, Johnson and Johnson to really optimize their internal processes and come up with internal tools or solutions that they could use to improve their global processes. Customer experience design considers the end-to-end -end experience of the customer, both before and after conversion. So a lot of what we focused on today with the design thinking process was about building a product and product development and really thinking about the features of that product, but really customer experience spans beyond that. It thinks about all the marketing materials needed uh, before conversion or before customers even discover what your product is. Once customers discover your product, uh, you know, they might go on the website, they might click buy, but then customer experience design also focuses on what happens after they buy the product. So what kind of uh, support do they get? How, what are some touch points or engagement points they get even after they buy the product? That is customer experience design. It is more interdisciplinary with marketing, branding, and design. So it's that kind of interdisciplinary mix. An, a great example of customer experience design is the process of exploring all messaging to customers before, during, and after they buy a product or service. User experience design or product design, those terms are used interchangeably, is the process of creating products that satisfy user needs. So at the beginning of this talk, we talked about the design thinking process to build a certain creative project. That's what we're talking about UX. So UX is that creative process, which involves both UX research and UX design. A great example of user experience design is the process of understanding what users want before designing an app or web platform. And then UI is the actual visual visualization side. So it's not the full design process, but just creating the visuals for a certain product. An example of user interface design is the process of creating app screens or app workflows. So I threw a lot of definitions at you, so it might be great to visualize them. Uh, here's one visualization of how service design, CX, and UX all relate to each other. This one is my favorite one. We can start about thinking about systems design at a really broad level, even social innovation, government projects, social impact projects. Then it, you know, that leads to service design or thinking about behavioral sciences, marketing, industrial design. How are we optimizing the ways companies operate and internal processes for companies? That gets us into UX, cognitive science, human factors engineering, user research, and then finally UI design, the actual visualization of that product. Just another way to look at it, UI, UX, product, service, customer. And so with that, that was pretty much uh, most of the, what I wanted to go through. I also you know, would love it if you could visit www.id8labs.co if you want to learn more about the, our four month MBA program. What we really like to do is really focus on that uh, you know, the feasibility side of creative jobs. So we want to help you land a six-figure UX job or we will coach you till you get it. And the way we do this is with one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentorship, a group coaching and alumni coaching for life. So we really do mean it that we'll hold your hand every step of the way. And again, we have a course curriculum that you can check out on our website. You can also take a look at user testimonials. Uh, but again, I went through the design process with you. It's seven weeks of UX research, seven weeks of UX design, and then two weeks to put together a portfolio and resume. And what you'll be learning is not only about design thinking, but going through the full design thinking process yourself. You will be practicing with design and collaboration tools. You will run online workshops and you'll be able to build a really impactful portfolio and a project pitch showcasing your ideas. So 
I hope that you know you found this session useful and I hope you start to feel empowered to act on your ideas and really think more tactically about pivoting into a new creative career path. Um, and I hope you leave this session with a dis different perspective on than when you just started. Again, allow yourself to change in your mindset and rethink how you want to do things. That is the design process in a nutshell. So with that, I'll stop sharing and just see, does anyone have any questions, anything that you're thinking about that I could address? All right. Well, uh, if there's no questions, uh, thanks again for hopping on this call and um, hopefully you found it useful. I see a question, what are your thoughts on the current job market in UX? That's a really great question. Um, I would say that, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. There were tech layoffs this past year. So between last summer and this summer, um, there, there have been tech layoffs. But what we have found is that the job market is picking back up and that there is more demand for UX put roles and positions now. Uh, and our alumni, to answer Samantha's question, have worked at CVS, uh, GE Aviation, um, Los Alamos Labs, uh, Capital One, where else, PNC Bank, um, and so much more. Um, and you'll find that information on our website as well. BNY Mellon is another one of them. Yeah. Right, any other questions? And I hear another question, how should we keep up with UX UI trends? I think, you know, by going on events, looking at YouTube videos, um, articles that are more current, uh, talking to designers is another great way. Um, but I think I would also just take a course. So I think a, the right UX course will streamline your entryway into the, a new career path and give you kind of the cheat sheet that you need to fast track your, your ability to get into a certain career. Yeah, of course, no problem. Thank you so much for joining. And uh, if you were would like to join our community, please check out the website. Um, we have a Slack community of over 7,000 folks. That's another way to keep up with the trends. All right. Thank you so much, folks. And I will see you later at some point.